In this video, we're going to be talking about something called vector spaces. The idea of a vector space is pretty straightforward, but it would be helpful to know what it means to be a space in general, mathematically speaking. So let's take a look at that first. Here are a couple of examples. If you were to flip a coin, the possible outcomes of that flip are heads or tails. And what we say is that one of these is a sample. Uh, if you flip a coin once, you're either going to get heads or tails. You can't get both. So one of these is a possible outcome, and the possible, the total possible outcomes is what we call the sample space. Now, if you were to flip a coin twice, you might get heads on the first one and heads on the second one. Or you might get heads on the first flip and tails on the second. Or you might get tails first and then heads. Or you might get tails both times. This collection of outcomes over here is the sample space for flipping a coin once. This is the sample space over here for flipping a coin twice. It's all the possible outcomes for the entire experiment. Now, if you were to flip a coin three times, you would actually have quite a few more entries here. You'd have heads on all three flips, heads on the first two, and tails on the second one, on the third one rather, heads, tails, and then heads, tails, heads, and then heads. And that's what I've done here is I've created one with all three, and then I've put the, the one tails that might occur in each of the three positions. Now I'm going to create uh, a list of one where there are two tails, and so I'm going to put the head in all three possible positions. So we could have heads, tails, tails, or we could have heads, tails, heads, tails, or we could have tails, tails, heads, or we could have all three tails. So this is the sample space for flipping a coin three times. This sample space, actually, it probably would have been better if I had, for consistency, put the other outcome here. So here we have a list of two outcomes, a list of four, and this is a list of eight. Since there are two possible outcomes, every time you add a flip, it's going to double the number of outcomes. That's a little almost trivia from an elementary statistics, probability and statistics class. My point is that this, this collection here is what we call the sample space, the space of all possible outcomes of a, of a coin flip. A Euclidean space, on the other hand, is the collection of all possible things in a particular dimension. So let's say we're in R2. And so one of the things in R2, when we talk about Euclidean space, we're kind of talking about, in R2, we can call it Cartesian space. So there's a point 0, 0 in Cartesian space. There's a point 0, 1. There's a point 0, 2. There's a point 0, negative 1. And obviously, there are an infinite number of those. And then there's a point 1, 1, 1, 2. 1, negative 1, and there's an infinite number of those. So there are actually an infinite number of elements, if you will, in this collection. This is a small subgroup of the space of R2. The space of R2 is all such elements. Well, when I was working with coin tosses or coin flips, I could actually list uh, the all of the elements in a, in a set. What I've neglected here to point out is that there are even things like 0, 0 0.1, and negative 0 0.5, 0 0.0003, and pi e, and so on. There are literally an infinite number of possible ways to combine two real numbers. And so there's no way for me to, to list them all. But I, what I might do is say, I'm going to erase some of this. is I might say that R2 is made up of the set, That's uh, those curly brackets are for set notation, and here's how we write a set. I'm going to say that R2 is made up of all of the elements that look like this, x1, comma, x2, you might see this as x, comma, y, and that notation should look familiar, such that x1 and x2 
I've run out of room again. Let's get rid of some more of this stuff. Are elements of or members of the set of real numbers. So it kind of looks like I'm I'm basing this the definition of R on R, but I'm not. I'm basing the definition of R2 on the definition of, of R. And I'm assuming here that people know that this is the set of all real numbers. And by set, we just mean collection, right? There's this big fancy subdomain in mathematics called set theory. And there's a lot that goes on in that, that domain. But when we talk about a set in very general terms, all we really need is a collection. Specifically, we mean the collection of everything that meets the criteria. So R, let me write it separately here, R is the set of all real numbers. And when I say all real numbers, I mean all real numbers. So pi e one of the one over the square root of 17. If it's real, if it's a real number, it's in this set. It's in this collection. Well, R2 is just made up of pairs of numbers x1 and x2 that are in the real numbers. So take any two real numbers, pair them, and that's an element of this set, this collection. And the other word we're using for that here, of course, is space. This is the this is what we call Euclidean space. Um, you might you might hear it called Cartesian space because it's in R2, um, but that's kind of a special case because the next one would be R3. You do occasionally, by the way, see this annotated. Uh, let me see if I can. I'll put this in a different color. You'll sometimes see the real numbers annotated as R1. It's kind of unusual, but it does happen. R3 is the set of all collections of three numbers, such that those three numbers are in, are elements of, are members of the set of real numbers. So R3 is the collection of all combinations of three real numbers in this notation. Well, I could go on forever, but let's just do this. We can generalize this by saying that Rn is equal to, or is defined as, the collection of x1, x2, all the way through x sub n, such that those numbers are all real numbers. They're all in the set of real numbers. We call this a triple. We call this a, a an ordered pair. We call this an ordered triple. We run out of sort of specialized notation or, or vocabulary pretty quickly. So we call this an n-tuple. And it's probably important to, to point out that this is an ordered n-tuple as well in that, um, let's go back up to the, the R3 case x1, x2, x3 is a different set, a different member of the set than x2, x1, x3. And that's different from x3, x1, x2. So this is an ordered triple. This is an ordered pair. This is an ordered n-tuple. So now we have this vocabulary, if you will, for an ordered n-tuple. Uh, something we call a collection or a set. This is a set of all uh, all n tuples that are made up of real numbers. Okay, but the other word we have for this is a space. This is a collection of all possible combinations of these numbers in this format. In particular, we're going to call this the n dimensional Euclidean space. Euclidean just refers to the fact that the, the things I'm talking about, these numbers in here all come from the real numbers. So the makeup of this n-tuple here is all real numbers. That's really all that means. 
Now, on a slightly different note, uh, related but different at the moment, remember that a vector is anything, any collection of real numbers that I can represent. Let's see, I'm going to use the square brackets for now just because that's what your textbook is doing. Uh, x1, x2, etc., up to xn. Now, x, n might just be 2 or 3 or 5. And in a lot of cases, I'll be able to write out all of the elements, all of the components of my vector. But this is a nice generic one. So I can talk about uh, an n-dimensional vector without necessarily knowing what that dimension is. So I can write that vector that way, or I can write it this way, x1, x2, right? I can write it vertically. So it's just a different way to write this vector. If I take all of the vectors for which this is true, I can write it this way, or I can write it this way, and all of its components are real numbers, then we call this the n-dimensional Euclidean vector space. Now, to distinguish the n-dimensional Euclidean vector space with a specific vector v, v might be in that collection, but I want to be able to write the, the space itself. I'm going to use capital V notation for that. I don't think your textbook specifically does that but I'm going to introduce that here just so that it's easier to follow, it's easier to distinguish. The n-dimensional Euclidean vector space I could write as the set of all vectors. Such that those vectors have components in the real numbers that come from the set of real numbers. We're going to add to this definition uh, that scalar multiplication and vector addition must be possible on these vectors. But because for right now we know that they are uh, vectors like this or vectors like this, uh, we can do scalar multiplication on these and we can do a vector sub, uh, addition and subtraction. Um, so these will all qualify even with that restriction on that restriction that we must also be able to perform scalar multiplication and vector addition. These will still all work. Um, later on, we may find that some of the new vectors that we play with later in the quarter, those restrictions may alter things a little bit. So we're going to place them now so that we don't forget about them. So what we have here is what we're going to be calling a, an n-dimensional Euclidean vector space. That is our definition. All right, let's take a look at some of the things that um, happen in this sort of collection. What you, if I talk about the collection of real numbers, you know that you can add two real numbers and you get another real number. That's called closure, closure under addition. There are some properties of vector spaces. We'll get to the more formal properties in a minute, but let's take a little uh, look now at some of the other things that we can do within this vector space. Now going forward, a lot of the vectors that we're going to be working with are arranged in this vertical method. So I'm going to be doing that here. Let's take two vectors, one, two, three, and this other vector, one, two, three. Now I hope you'll agree with me that because each of the components is equal to the other component, the corresponding component in the in the other vector, I call this one u and this one v. We can say that u is equal to v. If I had two vectors r, one, two, three, and s, one, three, two, those vectors are not equal. Because component-wise, they're not the same. This, this x2 component is not the same as the other vector's x2 component. So those two vectors are not the same. Equally, if I have vectors a, 1, 2, 3, and b, 1, 2, 3, 4, those vectors are not equal. In fact, I probably should have said this on the previous screen. 
these two vectors are not even in the same vector space because this one's in vector space R3 and this one's in vector space R4. So we can't compare them because we don't have a fourth component here to compare with the fourth component of the other vector. Now if I say vector, oh I run out of letters here, uh, W equals 3x minus 1 uh, 0 2 plus y and vector I don't know p I guess is equal to 1 2 3 4 both of these vectors are in uh, the fourth dimension Euclidean vector space, so they're both in R4, uh, but I don't know what X and Y are. What I can do here, actually I meant to change one of these two. Here, let me change the one of these components. I've actually changed two of them. I changed the, the first component in P and the third component in P. But with a little bit of uh, really sort of essential algebra, I could figure out what these other values are here. In order for W to equal P, for W to equal P, it must be true that 3 equals X because vector equality means that component by component these two values must be the same. Well I've got another X here so it also better be true that 3 minus 1 equals 2. That's supposed to be a 2. If I add 1 to both sides here, sorry, x minus 1, getting ahead of myself, x minus 1 equals 2. If I add 1 to both sides, I do get that x equals 3. So that still holds x equals 3. And then I have 0 has to equal z, and 2 plus y has to equal 4. So 2 plus y has to equal 4, which means y has to equal 2. So I can figure out what the values of those sort of variables are. 0 equals z is also given, right? That's pretty much all we need to do in this video. We're going to take a deeper look at some of the properties of, of Euclidean vector spaces in the next video.